This is the course Statics. My name is Carmen Mueller Carger. The reference for this presentation will be our textbook, The Hibler from Pearson. The course will be divided into 10 modules, which represent the 10 chapters that we will be covering for this course. The first one, which we'll be covering today, is the introduction. Next week, we will cover the second chapter and so forth. So let's start with the introduction. Mechanics is the branch of physics concerned with the rest or motion of body that are under the action of forces. And I want to uh, introduce you the mechanics with this example. Here we have a representation of this truck that is carrying this load over here. Purpose would be that this truck is in equilibrium, meaning that the weight of the truck support the load. Let's watch this video and see if the purpose was actually accomplished. <laughs> disaster because the load of the truck was not enough to support the load that it was uh, carrying. So we will learn how to uh, understand if this system is in equilibrium or in motion. There are other examples like this crane holding this airplane. It will be a disaster also if that crane will not be able to hold that plane. We will also learn how to calculate, for example, the trajectory of this ball when it's kicked by this boy, and this is in dynamics with each the next course. There are many applications. You can use it to analyze mechanisms, engines, motors, etc. You can use it to analyze rehabilitation machines. You can use it to design or analyze bridges and structure. You can use it to analyze the muscular skeletal system and also to do motion analysis, etc. Mechanics has three different branches, rigid body mechanics, deformable body, and fluid dynamics. In this course, we will study rigid body dynamics in statics and the next course, dynamics. So here we are in statics. Dynamics is the following course. Mechanics of Materials is the following course and Transport Phenomena of Fluid Dynamics. You will take it after you pass Dynamics. A very, very brief introduction to the history of classic mechanics. From the beginning, humanity is using mechanics concepts. As you hear the level, Chimedes was uh, one of the first and uh, to introduce the, the, the principles in, he, in his hydraulic experiment. Galileo in 1500s to 1642 is one of the most important astronomers that did great contribution to the study of motion of bodies. Newton was the first to identify the three laws of motion and to prove that these laws govern both here at Earth and in celestial, celestial objects. And this quote from Newton is one of my favorite, and it says that if I have seen farther, it has been because I have standing on shoulders of giant, meaning that he recognized all the work that people prior him did. And that's the same that you have to do. We are learning here the basics, and eventually you will be able to contribute to engineering and to science. After Newton, there came many more that extended Newton's law, as for example, Leonard Euler, that uh, translated all the Newton's life from particles to rigid bodies and actually the two additional laws. And then we have Joseph Lagrange, who made significant contribution to the field of analysis and um, theory with classical and 
celestial mechanics. William Hamilton discovered new mathematical concepts and technique and his best known contribution to mathematical physics is the reformulation of Newtonian mechanics. And we cannot uh, talk about mechanics without naming Albert Einstein that developed the theory, the theory of relativity, one of the more, uh, two pillars of modern physics. Einstein is best known for a popular culture in his mass energy equivalence formula. This one over here, and we will be using that in dynamics. And I really like this quote too, is imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, imagination is in cycles the world. And this one is very important too. Only the ones who does not question is safe to make mistakes. That's why I always think that you should ask, make questions, learn. So the definition of statics. Statics studies the equilibrium of bodies when the body is either at rest or move at a constant velocity, meaning it has no acceleration. When the object moves, it can be considered a special case of dynamics. Here's some examples, as we said here in a crane. Here, for example, maybe this uh, little board is in motion but at constant velocity. And here we have somebody doing a squat in equilibrium. What is important is that this Newton's second law is force equals mass and acceleration. When we have acceleration equals to zero, we have force equals to zero. And that's what we call equilibrium. It's very important, uh, the study of statics, and we will be able to apply it to many different areas, to design buildings, bridges, towers, structural supports, uh, concrete or built support beams, frames, machines, etc. As I said, part of the mechanics is also dynamics, and dynamics is the study of motion of the objects, including accelerations and forces that produce the motion. Dynamics is divided in two branches, kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics studies the motion of the object without reference its cause, so only studies the calculation of position, velocity, and acceleration of particles and rigid bodies. And kinetics studies the forces and the acceleration, so it studies the cause of the acceleration. So here we study only position, velocity, and acceleration, and here we study the whole full Newton's second law. In order to uh, study the complex real world, we will do some idealizations, which are called models. A model is a simplification or a simplified version of a physical system, and we will remove all the unnecessary aspect of the, a particular situation in order to study the behavior of the body. The most common models are called particles and rigid bodies. For example, if we have this fancy car, in order to study the reactions of the will, which are the, the normal forces, we will ignore all the details. And we may draw this fancy vehicle as a simple box. And this box, it will be called a rigid body. We will have as one of the models, a particle. A, a particle is an object which size can be neglected. A particle is like a pawn or node compared to other objects. For example, the Earth going around the sun, it could be considered a particle. So we will ignore the rotation about its own axis when we study it as a particle. Or for example, a rocket. The motion of a rocket could be also considered a particle. And we will neglect the rotation about its own axis. 
the other model that we have is the rigid body and it usually have mass, but it always uh, it very important that we will consider its sides, meaning that we will uh, consider the rotation about the axis, its own axis. For example, this airplane has three different possible rotation, which is raw, yaw, and pitch. Another idealization is the forces. We will consider concentrated forces which represent the effect of a loading, assuming that it acts on a single point. For example, the weight of that is uh, carried by this wheel will be applied to just one point over this rail. Or here, the weight of this object will be considered at its center of mass. So that we have concentrated forces, we will also have distributed forces. So for example, here the weight is a distributed force that we could find an equivalent system, which is a concentrated force. We will learn how to do that. The distributed forces can be caused by weight, as we said, but also by wind, fluids, or some other effects. In mechanics, to solve problems, we will use the two different unit systems. There are four fundamental physical quantities or dimensions, which are length, mass, time, and force. And we will use the international system, SI, or the U.S. customary unit system. The international system of units, SI, is the most widely used system of measurements, and the base Units are the meters to measure distance, kilograms to me measure mass, and seconds to measure time. And it usually refers as to MKS, meter, kilogram, second. There are derived units from these base units. One of them is the uh, units for force, which is the newton. One newton is the force needed to accelerate one kilogram of mass at a rate of one meter per second squared in the direction of the applied force. So here is the one newton is equals to one kilogram times one meter over second squared. In the case the U.S. customary units, the base units are the foot, inches, or yard to measure distance, seconds to measure time, but pounds to measure force. In the previous international unit system, it was mass to measure a, a base unit, but here is pounds to measure force. And the derived unit slot is measures mass and is pounds divided by gravity, therefore it's pounds times second square over foot. Here we have a table in this column, we have all the units for the international uh, unit system. And here we have this third column is the one to measure the U.S. customary units. And here we have another units for in the metric system. And here we have different other units also. We will you mainly use these two columns or convert every unit to these two columns. Here we have some conversions. One foot is equal to 0 0.3048 meters. One slug is equal to 14.59 kilograms. Very important. All the terms in an equation must be expressed in the same unit system. That is what is called dimensionally homogeneous. We Anytime that we are given data in two different unit systems, we have to put everything in one system and calculate everything in only one unit system. This is very important when we work, for example, in the metric system or international system, we use this uh, quantity to calculate everything for the gravity, right? Because weight, one kilogram weights 9.81 newtons. In the U.S. customary units, one slug weights 32.2 pounds.
we can see how to convert because we can convert one meter is 3.2828 feet and then that's why we can convert from the international system to the U.S. customary unit system. There is here another factors of conversion. For example, kilogram force can be converted to pounds by multiplying by 2.2. Kilogram force can be converted to newtons by multiplying 9.81. And newtons can be converted to pound by multiplying by 4.45. If we want to convert, for example, 350 pounds or a feet cubed to kilonewtons of a meter, we use these conversions and first we will convert the pounds into kilograms, the feet into meters, getting this number over here. Then we multiply by the gravity and then we get convert the kilograms into newtons. And then if we want to express our answer in kilonewtons, we have to divide by 1,000. So the final result is, result is 54.46. Another example, if we want to convert 5 slug over feet cube to kilograms over meter cube, then we know the basic conversion. So we have to convert the slug into kilograms and the feet cube into meters. And this is the number that we get. It's very important to understand the prefix when we have a quantity that involves giga, it means that we have to multiply by 10 to the ninth. Mega is 10 to the sixth. Kilo is 10 to the third. Then we have milli, which is 10 to the negative three, micro, which is 10 to the negative six, and nano, 10 to the negative nine. Another important aspect when we are calculating uh, our problems is to consider significant figures. The number of significant digits displays is an indication of the accuracy of the numbers. We can use calculated and sometimes we overstate the accuracy of the number. For example, if we have a rectangular bar which measures 25.5 millimeters, that meaning three significant figures, by 30.01, four significant figures, we get the results and we can get the result with six significant figures, but this number doesn't is too accurate for the data that we were given. Therefore, we will use and we, uh, the minimum amount of significant figures of the data given. In this case, we have one with three significant figures and another number with four significant figures. So we'll give our results with only three significant figures because we do not have more accuracy for our calculations. From time to time, you may want to use your spreadsheet to comp or calculator to have more significant figures, but the final answer will should be given with the amount of significant figures as the least amount of uh, significant figures given by the data. Let's talk a little bit about the rules for counting significant figures. Zeros within a number are always significant. So here we have four significant figures and here also four significant figures. All zeros when decimals are present are also significant. Here we have four and here also four significant figures. Zeros without decimal figures do not count as significant figures because this number over here, I can write it in scientific notation as 34 times 10 to the third. However, if I put a decimal point, then those zeros start to count as significant figures. Leading zeros do not count either as significant figures. So this number over here has only three significant figures. And this one over here has only two significant figures. Rounding off a number is necessary so to the accuracy of the result will be the same as the problem data. 
any number ending in a number of greater than five is rounded up, or a, if it's less than five is rounded, a, is not rounded up, is rounded down. And I'd advise only round the final result. Use all the significant figures for all the calculations. There's, you will see that we will work with problems with several steps. Use all your significant figures until the end and only round the results. Otherwise, you will carry rounding errors. In order to calculate the position of a system, we will use a reference frame. We will use a orthogonal reference frames x, y, z. Orthogonal meaning that there is 90 degrees between each of the axes. And we will use a right hand rule and we will be covering that in chapter 4. Let's just review the concept of mass. Mass can be generalized as the amount of matter of an object as a physical property of the object, but we can also give it another meaning, which is the me is a measure of the object resistant to motion or resistant to acceleration. Because when we analyze the Newton's second law, force is equal to mass acceleration. The bigger the mass, the more force I have to apply to accelerate an object. Mass is not the same as weight. An object on a moon will weigh less than it does on the Earth because of the lower gravity, but it still has the same mass. Mass is a scalar value and weight is a vector. So if we see this person which has a mass of 100 kilograms, its weight, their weight in the Earth will be 980 newtons, but over the moon will be 162 newtons. Because the gravity on Earth is 9.81 and, and the moon is 1.6 meters over second square. Also very important to review the difference between a scalar quantity and a vector quantity. Examples of scalar. We have temperature, density, speed, color, mass, and pressure. And vector is a geometric object that is described with three quantities. We say magnitude or direction and sense. So sense, it could be, for example, when you push or pull to open or close a door. That's the sense of the picture. Let's review Newton's laws. We have four different laws. Let's go over them very quickly. This is a review because you should have studied that in physics. The first Newton's law is the law of inertia. An object, particle or rigid body, at rest or in motion at a constant velocity, it stays in rest of motion with the same speed and the same direction unless acted upon an unbalanced force. This is this loss implies equilibrium. Some examples, an object that is moving, trap to keep moving, even though it's suddenly stop, or an object that is a, a rest, wants to stay at rest when it tries to move it fast. The second Newton's law, which is the law of motion, that's the most important law for this course, and it says that an object could be a particle of a rigid body subjected to an unbalanced force will experience an acceleration directly in proportion to the magnitude of the net force in the same direction of that force. This acceleration will be inversely proportional to the mass of the object. This is written mathematically as force equals mass times acceleration. If we apply a force to a very small mass, we will have a very large acceleration. We, if we apply the same force to a very big mass, we will have a very 
tiny acceleration. That's why we can say that the mass represents the resistant to motion of the object. The third Newton's law is also very important for this course. This is the law of action and reaction. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The mutual force of action and reactions in every interaction are equal, opposite, and collinear. Meaning, if this person pushes the wall, the wall will push that person in exactly the same direction, and as you see, those two forces are collinear, are parallel to each other. Here, for example, if we see the force that this mass is adheres to that beam, which is an action force, we will have a reaction force of the beam over this mass. More examples. This person is pushing the wall and the wall is pushing it back so that person moves forward. Or the action of a rocket pushes on gas, the reaction force pushes the rocket. And here too, when the ball in a canyon goes out by, because of the explosion, the canyon will go back. Finally, we, um, we finish the introduction for statics, and it's very important to understand that one of the main uh, aspects that we will need besides well, all the concepts that you know from math and physics is the trigonometry. And we will do a trigonometry a review in order to make sure that we have all those concepts very solid.